The Revenge Tour, the dream season for the 2023 Texas Longhorns has come to an end as they fall in the Sugar Bowl 37 to 31 to the Washington Huskers. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. And on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we are addressing the game from all angles. The Sugar Bowl last night, the Washington Huskies defeating the Texas Longhorns in the first segment. We're going to give credit where credit is due and talk about everything that Washington did in order to win this game and move on to the national championship. And then in the second and third segment, which you likely came for, I get real passionate and talk about why Texas lost this game and, you know, who deserves the blame that should go around, right? Whether it's Quinn Ewer, Steve Sarkeesian, the offensive line, the running backs, the defense, whoever you felt like played a part in Texas season ending last night, we address all of it, all that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that I am holding the mic today rather than the mic being supported by a crane. The reason I'm doing that is because I literally just got off the road, uh, drove back from Dallas to Houston, that's where I spent New Year's, Dallas slash Arlington. Um, and so I didn't have time to come in and do the full setup right before I go to work. So I just had to run in here and record real quick. Um, I also wrote the entire show or all of my notes on I-45, <laughs> right, driving back from Dallas to Houston this morning, right? I don't, you know, recommend that. Don't try that at home. For sure, you should not be on your phone while you're driving. But I just had to let y'all know, you know, how much of a superhero effort it took <laughs> you know, this morning to get this podcast out before I go to work, right? I'm trying my best to be timely and consistent. <laughs> so that's the sacrifices I got to make. When we look at the Sugar Bowl last night, it was an excruciating way to lose for Texas fans, right? I would have much rather Dylan Johnson not get hurt. There only be like 12 to 15 seconds left on the clock. And then none of us have the expectation that, oh, Texas is going to win, right? We know it's going to take some crazy Hail Mary or some crazy hook and ladder play to even have a chance of winning, right? And so then when it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, well, we really had no chance. The fact that we got life breathe into us right you know by one of the craziest rules ever that Washington gets penalized for one of their players getting hurt we get 45 seconds on the clock we get down into the red zone with four straight attempts right we get right down into the red zone with four passing attempts to win the game and cannot convert on any of them we don't get a single yard right once we get into the red zone that was very disappointing and it added an extra level of pain an extra layer of pain to Texas fans who already were going to have to deal with a tough loss. The fact that you got all that hope on the final drive just for it to still end in the same exact result was very excruciating. Like I said, I would have much rather Dylan Johnson not got hurt, and we just had no hope at all because once Jordan Whittington caught that ball on the Washington side of the field on the 28-yard line, I said to myself, oh, we're not losing this game. We're winning this game. They can't stop us from getting in the end zone, and they did indeed stop us from getting in the end zone. So, you know, what a great game overall. But as a Texas fan, you certainly feel hurt by way the game by the way the game ended. I think the biggest story, the biggest reason Washington won um, is Michael Penix Jr. Right. That's not a hot take. That's not a crazy take. He was clearly the best player on the field. But I think it goes past last night. Right. I think he showed why he's been the most productive passer in college football the last two years. And more importantly, while Washington is currently on a 21 game win streak. And they are 25 and two since he arrived on campus. When you look at what he was able to do last night in the passing game, 29 of 38 for 430 yards, two touchdowns and a 97.7 QBR out of 100. Right. So he was spectacular. Um, one of the most electric playoff performances we've seen. Right. I know it's hard for Texas fans to put that in perspective because it happened against us. But you haven't seen too many playoff performances better than what Michael Penix Jr. put on tape last night against his Texas defense. And just aside from the stats, right, you can look at the box score and marvel at what he did. But when you look at what he was able to do in the game, I think that's what you look for in your franchise quarterback in the NFL. That's what you look for in your star quarterback in college, right? Just the fact that he was able to go out there and put on that type of performance, it breathes so much confidence into everybody on the sideline. And he showed 
everything you can ask for from a quarterback, everything you want to see from a high octane, efficient passing game, right? The tight window throws, whether it was down the field on the sideline, those passes to Roma Dunze or those tight windows in the zone coverage when he knew what the Texas defense was in and just needed to pick up a conversion. The, uh, the one to the tight end where it was like third down. And as soon as he snapped the ball, he threw it real quick to the tight end and got a first down conversion. Just so many tight window throws. The the touchdown on the first drive after uh, halftime when he comes down and Derek Williams is back in the game and he throws that touchdown in between Derek Williams and the other safety to Jalen McMillan. There was just so many tough throws that Michael Penix Jr. had to make in this game to beat this Texas football team and to beat this Texas defense. And it seemed like every time he had to make a 50-50 throw, it was a 75-25 throw for the Washington offense because they have Michael Penix Jr. The deep ball accuracy, it started from the first drive, right, with that deep pass uh, to Jalen Polk over – Terrence Brooks, like I said, the deep passes down the sideline to Roma Doomsday, they were all on the muddy. Anytime he got a deep opportunity to take a shot play and flip field position or put them in a better position to score, he hit on all of them. And really, when you look at it, this ended up being a one possession game, a six point game. So you can look at any of the plays that Michael Penix Jr. made and say they were the difference in the game. But the fact that something that's been, you know, a question mark for Texas for multiple years Michael Penny Jr. was able to come in the game and, you know, complete four to five deep passes down the field that really flipped field position and probably were the ultimate reason that Michael Penny Jr. won. I mean, to be to be that accurate. 40 50 yards down the field is crazy right and he just consistently did it to this Texas defense the poise in the pocket and the ability to evade pressure. We didn't get a ton of pressure on him, and we didn't get any sacks that I remember. But even when bodies were around him, right, Savandre Sweat, you know, uh, Byron Murphy, Ethan Burke got around him a couple times. There was one time that Justice Finkley got to him, and, you know, bless his heart, <laughs> you know, Michael Penix Jr. ran right by him. But the fact that this defense and this front seven had wreaked havoc on quarterbacks all year and offensive lines and offensive coordinators all year outside of the Oklahoma game. And Michael Penix Jr., to his credit, who said before the game, they're really talented, but they're not the 49ers or Eagles D-line. And he played like that. Like, he played like he had no fear of Byron Murphy to Andre Sweat in our front seven. And even when they got close to him, he was able to still stand there, poised in the pocket, and make throws down the field and get the ball into the hands of his receivers. And he had a master knowledge of the playbook, what the defense was giving him and where to go with the ball. It seemed like no matter what P. Kukowski did, no matter what look we gave Michael Penix Jr., he knew what was coming and he knew he had the answers to it. And then something that we had not really seen from Michael Penix Jr. this year, I think his season high for rushing coming into the game was like 12 yards. They mentioned on the broadcast, but he was able to pick up. 31 rushing yards on three carries, and I think all three of those carries were huge in terms of picking up first downs and throwing off our defense or at least giving them something else to account for. So Michael Penix Jr. was special last night. Obviously the MVP, obviously the biggest reason they won. That's what you want to see from your star quarterback, and that's one of the most electric passing performances we've ever seen in college football, especially in the playoffs with the national championship berth on the line. I want to talk about the receivers because Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, and Jalen McMillian are the best group of pass catchers in the country when you're talking about wide receiver and not just college football, right? There's some NFL quarterbacks that wish they had Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, and Jalen McMillan, the way that they can make tough catches and, you know, run routes and just, you know, play at a high level, right? It didn't matter who got the ball last night. They were all making plays. And even when you look at the tight end matchup where you would have thought, oh, okay, JT Sanders should be, you know, way better in this game than Jack Westover. I actually think that that matchup was a wash as well. So their quarterback and their pass catchers, really just outshined our quarterback and our pass catchers with both with both pass defenses being a little bit questionable. When you look at Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, and Jalen McMillan in this game, right, they showed everything that makes them special. The contested catches, the strong hands. Even when Michael Penix Jr. threw a couple passes low, they were able to get it off the, the turf, you know what I mean, throwing it downfield, those contested catches, the 50-50 balls to be able to track those balls in the air, keep your eyes on them, you know, and, and still make those catches. They were special. Great releases off the line. You know, I, lo I know a lot of people – said they wanted to see some tighter coverage i think we would have got eight up the same way right you know what i mean you were trying to give them some cushion so you could guard them down the field but you know there were certain instances where we played them up at the line of scrimmage and they just smoked us down the field because they know how to get off the line these are professional receivers that will make an impact in the nfl and we just didn't have the personnel on our side of the ball to stop them or the quarterback that was delivering the ball to them and then they had the ability to draw penalties as well right even when um you know terrence brooks was beat 
and they weren't able to complete the pass because he passed interfered. That's still 15 yards. Now it worked out for Texas because it was a 50 yard play, you know, and we only had to concede 15 yards. But that's what they do to your defense, right? They put so much pressure on your defense that even when they don't complete the pass, you still end up getting positive yardage because you can't cover them one on one. And I think. You know, in terms of the receivers and Michael Penix Jr., that was just such a great effort last night. Kalen DeBoer, there's a reason that he is 25 and two in his tenure at Washington. There's a reason that across all levels in college football, he has a 90 plus percent winning percentage in college football. And I think his calm demeanor and confidence resonate across the whole team. You could say the same thing about Michael Penix Jr. You could just see that the confidence he has in himself exudes itself across, you know, the entire team, even when they had that, you know, muff punt that led to Texas tying the game at 14. All Kalen DeBoer did not look shook, did not look worried. And I think that the team embodies that right where I think sometimes Sometimes Steve Sarkeesian can get a little bit emotional, good or bad, depending on, um, you know, how the game is going. And maybe if he gets tight in a certain moment or he gets upset in a certain moment, that can resonate with the team as well. I think Kalen DeBoer uh, did a really good job of being even keel regardless of what happened in the game. And I think that's the reason that this team has won 21 straight games, because they are a direct reflection of their head coach. I also want to give credit to Ryan Grubb because I thought he had great play calling and great play designing. And also he did a really good job of giving Texas one look seeing what defense they were going to play and then shifting it to the actual formation they were going to run. And so he forced the Texas defense and Pete Kukowski to consistently show their hand. And that's why Michael Penix Jr. knew what was coming because you didn't have time to change up the Texas defense after Washington switched into the actual formation they were going to run. And they pretty did that. They pretty much did that the majority of the game. So that was a really good play calling and play designing. Uh, from Ryan Grubb. And then last but not least, I'm going to give credit to Braylon uh, Trice and Jabbar Muhammad on the defensive side of the ball. I don't think the defense played great overall, but their two best players showed up and played as advertised. And that's a huge reason why Washington won as well. The truth of the matter is, you know, Texas fans talked about they got to deal with our passing offense, too. They got to deal with our weapons, too. You know, Sark can go out there in the game and out coach Kalen DeBoer. But the problem is or the truth of the matter, once again, is there's a gap and you can debate how big the gap is, but there's a gap. Between Kalen DeBoer and Sark, there's a gap. Between Michael Penix Jr. and Quinn Ewers, there's a gap. Between Romeo Odunze and Xavier Worthy, there's a gap. Between Jalen Polk and Adonai Mitchell, and there's a gap. Between Jalen McMillan and Jordan Whittington, and that's why Washington won this game, 37-31. to 31. Now, getting into why Texas lost and who deserves blame. Is it Quinn Ewers? Is it Steve Sarkeesian? The offensive line? The running backs? Some hard truths over the airwaves. Next, after a word from our sponsors. Today's episode of Locked On Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On and make your First bet, a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the National Football League. All right. Time for some hard truths. Time for some passion about why Texas lost. I know I lost some Texas fans in the first segment, glowing about Washington like that. I'm probably going to lose a little bit more here, right? But I've always vowed to tell the truth to say what I feel on the podcast, and here goes nothing, all right? The real ones will respect it. I saw a lot of talk after the game about how we should not be blaming Quinn Ewers or Quinn Ewers is not the reason that we lost. And I completely disagree. Obviously, if there is a pie chart in front of me, I would not put 100% of the blame on Quinn Ewers. But Quinn Ewers is certainly one of the reasons we lost. And he is absolutely one of the biggest reasons we lost this game. Right. So, like I said, you know, I knew that this would happen when I went and looked at the box score and saw that he threw for 318 yards, that people would come back and say Quinn Ewers was not one of the biggest reasons we lost. And that is categorically false. He's the starting quarterback for this team. He threw the ball 43 times. He is absolutely one of the biggest reasons we lost. And yes, the two fumbles by the running backs had a huge impact on the game. And yes, the 10 penalties killed crucial drives for the Longhorns. And yes, the defense did allow over 500 yards of offense. So obviously, once again, Quinn Ewers is not the sole reason that we lost. But all of that, everything I just mentioned, the fumbles, the penalties, the defense, 
led to the ball being in your five-star quarterback's hands, Quinn Ewer's hands, with the chance to win the game. So I don't want to go back and make the argument that, well, if we didn't fumble, or well, if we didn't commit the penalties, or well, if we didn't give up these yards, because all of that resulted in Quinn Ewers having the ball in his hands with the chance to win the game. So I don't want to hear about what about ism, you know, oh, the fumbles this and oh, the penalties this, because if I'm a Washington supporter, and honestly I'm not, but if we're going to play the what if game, okay, so what if Michael Penix Jr. doesn't miss his backup tight end on a wide open touchdown? What if Washington's punt returner doesn't muff a punt that leads directly to seven points for Texas? What if on that pass back to Michael Penix Jr., the receiver doesn't throw it in the dirt and Michael Penix Jr. runs for 30, 40 yards or possibly even scores? Texas isn't even in a position to win the game at the end. So, of course, we can say what if, what if, what if about everything that happened outside of Quinn Ewers. But the problem with what about ism is we can say that about literally anything. <laughs> and there's a bunch of things that could have happened on the Washington side that would have made this game a blowout. What I know for a fact and what you know for a fact is this game ended with the ball in Quinn Ewer's hands. And in his last four passes in the red zone, the Texas offense did not gain a single yard. Quinn Ewer's threw 19 incompletions. And I know it's hard for some people to put that in perspective, but he threw 19 completions. Right. Excuse me. 19 incompletions last night in the Sugar Bowl. His previous season high was 14 against Alabama. So that's a huge jump, right, from 14 incompletions to 19 incompletions. Texas only ran 71 offensive plays. On 19 of them, you gained zero yards from your five-star quarterback. So please don't tell me that he is not one of the biggest reasons we lost the game when he threw 19 incompletions on 71 offensive plays. His lowest completion percentage of the season outside of the Wyoming game, only completing 55% of his passes. And when you look at the last four passes of the game, and I know Steve Sarkeesian maybe deserves some blame for this, but we don't know what the play call was or what Steve Sarkeesian told him the play call was or where to go with the ball before the play started, right? Last four passes of the game. Your five-star quarterback has the ball in his hands with the chance to send Texas to the national championship game in the red zone. The first throw, a panic throw to Jaden Blue because he was scared of the pressure. Checks it down to Jaden Blue. We lose a yard. Some people are going to put that on Steve Sarkeesian, say that was the play call. Until you can show me that that exactly was the play call. It was designed to go to Jaden Blue or Steve Sarkeesian told Quinn Ewers to specifically throw the ball to Jaden Blue. I'm going to assume that Steve Sarkeesian was not going to throw a ball behind the line of scrimmage with that little time on the clock, no timeouts and a chance to go to the national championship game. I think Quinn Ewers felt the pressure and checked the ball down to Jaden Blue, which was a bad decision. On second down, an uncatchable pass to Adonai Mitchell where he throws the ball out of the end zone. That was also the only read he made, right? So you're in the red zone with Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington, and JT Sanders, and you only look at Adonai Mitchell. The third pass, a throw out of bounds caused by the pressure. It was a really good blitz by Washington, and Quinn Ewers actually did a really good job in terms of getting the ball out of his hands, right, and, you know, throwing the ball out of bounds to leave one second on the clock. And then the last play, which is going to be talked about forever, you throw a jump ball to Adonai Mitchell. Once again, the only read he made, right, game on the line, season on the line. You don't look at Xavier Worthy. You don't look at Jordan Whittington. You don't look at JT Sanders. You sit there and stare down Adonai Mitchell, and then you lob a jump ball when Adonai Mitchell has the entire front of the end zone to work with and the DB is retreating. If you throw any type of back shoulder, comeback route type ball or any ball where you place it in front of Adonai Mitchell and he can turn around and make a quick catch with quick hands, Texas is in the national championship game. But when you were stares down Adonai Mitchell, waits until he gets in the end zone and lobs an easy jump ball from the defender who's in zone coverage to jump up and knock down. So, you know, I'm not going to super put that on Quinn and say he should have thrown that type of ball because maybe he went into it knowing it was supposed to be a 50-50 fade. But that's the difference between a Michael Penix Jr. and a Quinn Ewers. And I'm not going to fault myself for having high expectations for a five-star quarterback who is 20 games in two off-seasons into his Texas experience. And 20 games in two off-seasons into this experience – it feels like to me, Quinn Ewers cannot be effective without a perfect pocket or receivers running wide open, and he can't grow through his progressions consistently. And of course, Quinn Ewers, out of 43 attempts, made five or six really good throws in this game. 
The problem is that's five or six out of 43 attempts, and that's just not good enough. So, yes, you can put as much blame as you want on Quinn Ewers on this game because we should, after two years, expect our franchise quarterback, our five-star quarterback in Quinn Ewers, to be able to go out there and make enough plays for us to win a football game. And in our two biggest games of the year, after Alabama, Oklahoma, and Washington, Quinn Ewers got outplayed by Dylan Gabriel and Michael Penix Jr., and that's why we lost both of those games. Now, Steve Sarkeesian, he deserves some blame as well. Having Keelan Robinson field kicks with one hand was ridiculous. I don't know why he made that decision or who approved that decision, right? Like somebody should have came up to him and said, bro, Keelan Robinson has one hand. I thought in his opening script, he did a beautiful job in terms of run designs in the opening script. I was sitting there watching the game with my grandpa, and I'm like, damn, I don't know who's going to get the ball, right? And clearly Washington didn't know who was going to get the ball because we were gashing them in the run game. But I thought he got away from that creati creativity in the latter part of the game and just really got to the basic inside zone. And it was still working. You were still getting five to six you know, yards a clip. But I thought Washington started to do a better job of stopping the run in the second half, mostly because Steve Sarkeesian made it easy on them and got away from all that emotion and the tricks and just started running it down the ball like we were so much better than them in the trenches and the play on the field shows otherwise right I think he tried too hard to be balanced last night and didn't allow Texas to play to their strengths it was obvious that Texas needed to run the ball a lot more than pass the ball to win this game right they started off with four incompletions in a 16 yard run by Cedric Baxter that should tell you what type of game this was going to be but instead I think that Steve Sarkeesian, like most offensive coordinators, felt like he had to be balanced instead of just going out there and saying, we're going to run the ball until they can stop it. Right. We are a running football team. We are a power running football team. That is our strength. Our strength is not letting Quinn Ewers throw the ball 43 times. We are a power run football team. But instead, Steve Sarkeesian turned this into a shootout between Quinn Ewers and Michael Penix Jr. And as we saw last night, that is advantage of Michael Penix Jr. If the ratio flips and Texas runs the ball 43 times and passes the ball 28 times, I'm very confident that Texas ends up winning that game. Of course, Jaden Blue, you had the crucial drop on a great throw by Quinn Ewers and a fumble. Of course, Cedric Baxter had a fumble. And the offensive line set the offense back multiple times with penalties. So you definitely can put the blame on a lot of people. But when you talk about the coach, when you talk about the quarterback, they get all the credit when things are going right. And so if I'm putting the majority of the blame on somebody who needed to go out there and win this game for us, it's Quinn Ewers and Steve Sarkeesian. They simply were not good enough. But I'm if I'm... Out of 100%, I'm putting 75% of the blame on Quinn Ewers because the game ended with the ball in his hands. And simply in the biggest games, Oklahoma and, you know, Washington, I'm not going to give him too much credit for outplaying Jalen Milrow. Y'all watched the full body of work from Jalen Milrow this season. Of course, Quinn Ewers is going to outplay him. But against Dylan Gabriel and Michael Penix Jr., twice now, Quinn Ewers was the second best quarterback on the field. But he's the five-star quarterback. He's the million-dollar quarterback. He's the one that was supposed to save Texas. He's one of the highest graded recruits of all time. And like I said, 20 games into the Quinn Ewers experience, he still feels like he's limited and our offense is limited because he's our starting quarterback. A quick word from our sponsors, and then I get into the defense. Did they play bad or were they just overmatched by a great offense? I think that all year, our defense was too reliant on Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy playing like all Americans, right? In pretty much every game that we played, right, 11 out of the, or I guess 12 out of the 14, I should say, Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy played like all Americans, right? And that's the reason that we were able to win those games. And most of the teams that we played in the Big 12, we dominated because they had no match for Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy. But we did not get great play from our edges this year. And I don't think overall Anthony Hill had a lot of flashes and Jalen Ford had a lot of flashes, but I don't think overall we got great play from our linebackers this year either. It really came down to what type of game to Andre sweat and Byron Murphy were going to have. And when they didn't have great games or when we could not get a pass rush, our back end got exposed. Now there were, you know, some context added and some conversations about our past defense is not as bad as we think it is. I think we could kind of put that to rest. You know, even though know, we went against, you know, probably the most elite passing offense in college football. I think you have to say it's the most elite passing offense in college football at this point. We still provided no resistance, right? And most of that is because we did not get a pass rush. So, you know, the two games that Byron Murphy and Tamandre Sweat didn't play like all Americans, we lost both to Oklahoma and to Washington. I thought they did a great job stuffing the run. I had no doubt in my mind they would do that. And of course, Tamandre Sweat missed a lot of snaps with what looked like he was dealing with an injury or something like that. 
So they did a good job of stuffing the run, but they did not affect Michael Penix Jr. at all in the passing game. And without Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy playing out of their minds, Texas on defense does not have the ability to stop anybody in the passing game. And that's what happened. Of course, you went against Michael Penix Jr., Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, and Jalen McMillan. And that's the biggest reason why we lost the game. So as good as this defense was at times this year, they were too overly reliant on Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat pay, playing like all Americans. They had two games where they couldn't do that this year. Texas, unfortunately, lost both of those games. And then, of course, we got nothing from our edge rushers in terms of pressure. And nobody in the back seven, whether it's safeties, linebackers, or corners on this defense right now, can consistently win in coverage without the pass rush affecting the quarterback, right? At least on Washington's end, they had Jabbar Muhammad, who was locking down Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy whenever he was in one-on-one -on -one coverage with them. We don't have one person in our linebacker group, one person in our corner group, or one person in our safety group where we can say, okay, put him on an island against that receiver, and he's going to take him out of the game, and we can shift coverage everywhere else. Ryan Watts got cooked, right? Terrence Brooks got cooked. Jade Barron, Malik Muhammad, whoever was back there, the safeties, the linebackers, they got cooked, right? Without Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy playing like all Americans, our pass defense is Swiss cheese, right? And we went against the, the, the last possible offense you want to go against if you can't get a pass rush in Michael Penix Jr. Uh, and, and that offense in the Washington offense. And then, you know, the last thing I want to say is just Pete Kukowski was overmatched, you know? Um, I'm more on the side of there's nothing really he could do. You know, you ever play – Madden on all Madden and you're playing on defense and it feels like when you play zone, they find a way to beat it. <laughs> when you play man, they find a way to beat it. When you blitz it, they find a way to beat it. Like there's just nothing you can do. You just start to feel helpless at this point and just hope and pray for a turnover, or a bad play from the offense. I feel like that's the position Pete Kukowski was in last night. You play off, they eat up that cushion or they come underneath and make a play. You play up on the line of scrimmage. They easily get past you with their release and make a catch down the field. You play zone and Michael Penix Jr. is disciplined enough to find the receivers in the zone. The receivers are good enough and know where to sit, you know, and have the awareness to sit down and make themselves available to the quarterback. And you play man. And once again, like I said, nobody in our back seven is good enough to cover those three receivers who will all make huge impacts in the National Football League. So I think we have good players on our defense, but they have great to elite players who are NFL ready players on their offense. And that ultimately was the difference. Like I said, there's a gap between Kalen DeBoer and Steve Sarkeesian. There's a gap between Michael Penix Jr. and Quinn Ewers. There's a gap between our three receivers and their three receivers. And ultimately, that was different. the difference in the game. So congrats to Washington. I will be rooting for Michael Penix Jr. and that Washington offense, just the whole team period, to make it 22 straight wins in the national championship against Michigan. And, you know, congrats to the Texas Longhorns. They certainly had an amazing season, but, you know, there's probably going to be players on this team that think about that game last night for the rest of their lives and what they could have done differently to put Texas in the national championship game in the city of Houston. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We officially do not have any more football games to talk about until September, but we're going to do our best to continue the coverage of the Longhorns, the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team, and anything else that's relevant to Texas athletics. Hook them. Peace.